So once again, welcome everyone to today's session of the Social Science Data Lab. My name is Dennis Cohen, and I am very happy to welcome you to today's talk in the Social Science Data Lab by Carsten Sauer on factorial survey designs. The Social Science Data Lab is an event series at the Mannheim Center for European Social Research that provides a platform for uh, our presenters to talk about tools and methods for the collection, management, analysis, and visualization of data in the social sciences. The Social Science Data Lab is organized by myself in collaboration with my colleagues Cosima Maya and Julian Bernauer with the support of our student assistant, Nick Baumann. Our speaker today is Carsten Sauer. He is full professor of sociology and social stratification in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at Zeppelin University in Friedrichshafen. His substantive work focuses on social inequality, social stratification, labor markets, empirical justice in research organizations and health. And methodologically, he's interested in quantitative methods with a focus on survey experiments and longitudinal data analysis. In his talk today, Carsten will talk about factorial surveys, also called vignette analyses, which is a method that integrates multifactorial experimental designs into surveys. He will talk about the design and implementation of these survey experiments, as well as about methods and best practices for managing and analyzing data from these surveys. Um, here is a brief disclaimer about the logistics for today's session. You may ask your questions for clarification during the talk, as well as all your questions in the Q&A after the talk, either by typing comment or questions in the Zoom chat. We can then call on you and ask yourself to unmute yourself and speak. You can post your questions in the chat and we will read them out for you. Or if you do want to, to pose your questions anonymously, you can send them to us via direct message and we will then read them out anonymously. Here's once again the disclaimer. We're recording today's live stream. We're recording it in, uh, in active speaker mode, which means that your video will not be recorded unless you unmute yourself and speak. And a recording of this video will be posted on our YouTube channel later on. So with that being said, Carsten, we are very happy to have you here today. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and uh, uh, of course, thanks everybody for um, for joining our uh, or for joining my talk today. Um, I try to um, to get the um, slides. Um, I hope everybody sees it now. Is it is it uh, possible? Cool. <clears throat> so my, my my talk is of course about the factual survey design and um, it will give you a quick ride through all uh, steps uh, in, in generating, implementing, and analysis of factorial surveys. But I will, of course, um, keep a focus on some, um, so within these parts, I will keep a focus on some substantive questions that are maybe um, of, of particular interest for you, for example, advanced uh, um, sampling methods and stuff like this. So, um, First of all, I will start with a with an idea of factorial surveys. And um, um, when you when you when you think about um, sorry, I have to put this here. When you when you when you think about um, <clears throat> in data collection methods, when you have responsive data, uh, we know lab experiments that that have a good control of unobserved influences. You have a high internal validity. Um, uh, combined with a high precision of, of measurement. What is the downside some people discuss is, um, yeah, we have an artificial situation, we are in the lab and not in a, in a natural environment. And of course, um, in many cases, selectivity of samples, convenient samples, student samples, stuff like this, it's, it's not, you know, not required, but it's of the case. On the other hand, when you, when you do survey research, you have, the good thing is that you have these um, um, sampling plans, that means everybody in your target population has a um, probability, a specific and specified probability to be part of your sample. And um, this, what, this is a good thing because it, it makes you able to, um, to make general this, um, um, yeah, conclusions about your um, population. And of course, what, what a sociologist or social scientist, what is nice, is having heterogeneous samples realized, um, including you know different different age groups, different um, different educational groups, and stuff like this. 
the downside is always the problem of unobserved heterogeneity. So we cannot really have measure here some 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 causal relations. I mean, there are ways to 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 tackle this with longitudinal data and stuff like this, but it's always uh, problematic. And um, of course, we measure in in many cases not actual behavior. And um, when you think of uh, now of survey-based experiments in 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 general. The idea is, or the basic idea was, uh, when when they came up, um, that that key features or cool features of both of these uh, data gathering methods can be combined. And on the one hand, you want to have this um, a control of unobserved influences uh, from the from the experiments, and on the other hand, you want to have a heterogeneous sample. You want to have a, a sample based on a sampling plan. And um, <clears throat> this is the, the, the basic idea why, why survey-based uh, survey experiments get implemented in, in surveys. And um, of course, you cannot, you cannot be as precise as you are in the lab, but still you have some manipulation going on and um, you, you can see, okay, how do people um, react on my, um, my treatment? And factorial surveys in particular now, when, when you think of them as a particular uh, survey-based experiment, um, they have this multifactorial design. And that means that you do not only vary one factor, like in a single factor experiment, but you will vary maybe three, four, five, ten, whatever. We will, we will talk about this in a second. But that makes it um, more complex, of course. Um, you can, you can um, simultaneously vary the attributes and therefore test also complex multi-cause relationships. Um, maybe because you think like, okay, there is an, for example, a two-way or three-way interaction between uh, different dimensions that, that work in a specific way. And you can, you can model this with factorial surveys. So this is, so to speak, the specifics of factorial surveys within the survey-based experiments. And um, when, we <clears throat> when we go to some, um, some um, basic definitions. So for those who are not, not uh, super familiar with the method yet, the um, respondents evaluate uh, short descriptions and these descriptions consist of objects or situations. And these um, <coughs> descriptions are called vignettes. And uh, you, you have a picture of a vignette uh, at the bottom of the presentation slide. And um, within these vignettes, there are different attributes and, and we call them uh, dimensions. And these dimensions are experimentally varied in their levels. That means um, a dimension is, for example, the age, and the level would be, in this case, a 35-year-old. And um, the experimental variation means in the next uh, vignette, this is maybe a 40-year-old, maybe a 60-year-old person, and stuff like this. So you, you vary the age um, from vignette to vignette. And there are basically two different uh, designs one, one has to choose. And this is the within subject design. It's, it's very often used. And it is like each respondent evaluates several vignettes, like 10, for example. And it has some nice um, um, features if you, if you have multiple ratings per respondent, because you can um, model um, individually specific uh, rating patterns. And also, you have more power, you have more data, and um, you, you, you can. Yeah, you can tackle your research questions um, with less um, respondents. The other um, um, data collection is, is between subjects designs, and this is each respondent evaluates one vignette. And in some cases, it makes sense to have only one vignette, maybe because you think like, okay, um, I, I have learning effects, or people will, will maybe get what I ask, and it is like a hidden question. You, you, you don't want them to be you know, to, um, to be aware of your, of your manipulation. And then you maybe decide, uh, I will only choose one vignette per person. It's also possible and has also been done a lot in, in this literature. And um, the basic <clears throat> goal of this um, 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 uh, factorial surveys and factorial designs is to test theoretical models. And um, that means um, you have like, before you have an idea what is my dependent variable, what are my independent variables, and how do they um, um, connect, how, how are they connected to each other? Like, is it an additive or a multiplicative or whatever um, 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 relation it may be? And I here, I just, I just wrote down some 
some functions. The first um, um, equation is, is, is an additive, like you, you, you think like my decisions, for example, my justice perceptions uh, of earnings are um, um, influenced by, by performance, by gender of the person and by age of the person, then it would be an additive model. If you think, if you think there is um, like a double standard in rates of return to performance and, and women will be tr um, evaluated differently than men, then you have in your mind like a multiplicative uh, design and you would model the interaction. And in this case, and especially in the case of factorial service, it is very important to have these um, decisions and these ideas before you even start constructing it. Because, um, and you will see it when we do the, the sampling stuff, um, it is important because um, otherwise these effects can be, can get confounded by design, yeah, and you can later not disentangle um, interaction effects anymore. So you you will you will do all the theoretical stuff before you get into the field, and you will not have like in items based research, you will not have the chance to to um, sneak something in afterwards when you when you did not care for it before. And um, okay, and the and the last um, equation is like the subjective expected uh, utility um, developed by by Essa and others. And you also see here the the utility is is shaped by the benefits and the probability of the benefits minus the costs and the be the probability of the costs. And um, so we did also some years ago a factorial survey design where we tested these. Um, relations also possible, but then you have to take care. Okay, I need interaction effects and these interaction effects need to be organ orthogonalized in my design and you will have to take care for this um, theoretically, methodologically and in the analysis. And, th and that's why um, um, I often already start with writing down a formula or, or s some some more more formalized uh, stuff because I know okay I need to um, to do the I, I need to do this for the sampling and for the analysis. And the, the goal is to measure the influence of, of single dimensions on evaluations, of course, so how, how these attitudes are affected by dimensions, also the interaction between them, and of course, um, respondent characteristics, how, how they um, um, are associated with, um, with evaluations. And of course, um, the disclaimer here is this method is, is for these reasons, not appropriate for exploratory analysis, so just throw in some dimensions, looking what happens is, is, is a very bad thing to do with factorial surveys. And um, <clears throat> I, will, I will start now with, a, with um, some, some examples to, to, uh, that you get a grasp on what is going on um, um, with the design. And um, what we did during the last year, some of the research was um, to investigate the gender gap. And this is uh, within the literature of the just gender pay gap. And this is basically a corresponds to the to the gender pay gap in earnings, um, that that there is research that shows people have in mind also these justice perceptions that not only the earnings are actually um, um, different between men and women, but there are justice perceptions underlying norms um, uh, that that um, that are in line with these um, um, findings. And um, we wanted to, to disentangle these effects and we wanted to find out, um, um, is there just gender pay gap and what are the reasons? And basically, when you, when you have um, only, uh, when you have like regular survey data, gender is co co uh, correlated with so many factors that are related to, to labor market, like part-time employment, like work experience, like tenure and stuff like this. And you will, uh, as, as you all know, of course, I will have different, very, um, Big differences to to really tackle what is the effect, what is the discrimination in this part. But in the sorry, in the experimental world, um, um you can create and and I showed it at the bottom of the slide. You can create like um, um a world that is gender equal, right? So so men and women are here of the same age, of the same. They have the same jobs. They have the same qualification and the same earnings. And then you can see, okay, I give this equal world into the survey, right? And I will see how, how much inequality gets back. And um, then I can determine how, how um, inequality perceptions are still persistent in, in the society. And um, this is, for example, now a, um, a 
paper that that is based on data collected in 2017 and you can see on the on the y-axis is the gender pay gap in percent so this just gender pay gap um, calculated based on the vineyards and you see on the on the on the x-axis the uh, respondents and in the in the first uh, graph you can see okay we have here a gender pay gap of like three percent and this is consistent for male and female respondents right so it is a like a very persistent pattern. If you look in the second, in the middle uh, figure, if, if you look at the different age groups of respondents, you can see, okay, younger people tend to have gender equal um, um, norms, but it's for, for the older age groups that produce this gender bias. And also if you, if you investigate different vineyard persons, because we're, like age was manipulated over, over, over the vineyards, and you can also see, oh, we have a gender bias for especially older, vineyard persons, not younger vineyard persons. So this is the kind of analysis you can you can do and can find out what are the patterns behind these these um, differences. Another study, um, which is originally which was surveyed in two thousand eight and two thousand nine, which is a, also a, a which was also a, 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 so both were large scale um, um, general surveys um, called here population sample one and two. And also in 2009, I think this was done, uh, this is a, pop a student sample of, of uh, 27 um, universities in Germany, so a big, a big study. And um, yeah, what we found out here is when you compare students to, to the regular population that you find, okay, students obviously do not show this gender bias so much. I mean, uh, male students obviously more than, than female students, but when you compare, the, uh, compare to the population, you find these uh, gender differences um, um, that they are they are much stronger, right? And um, so this is an indicator that something obviously happens uh, within the labor market, uh, or we have a core effect. So it, it is not distinguishable with a, with this um, with this um, uh, figure here, but but you see there's something going on, and and it it asks for deeper analysis. So, but this is the kind of research. One can do and can figure out, and and the cool thing is with a with a gender bias, for example, if you ask people in item, in items, do you discriminate? Do you think um, women should earn less than men? You will, and we did this, of course. We, you will always find, okay, no, everybody should get the same, of course. But if you if you ask them indirectly with a factual survey method, you will you will get out these 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 underlying um, um, norms, right? And and then um, you you gain something compared to items. Okay, so this is, so to speak, a, a short introduction into the into the method and um, some some um, examples. I will now uh, move to the construction of vignettes. So um, um, how to how to how to build a good design, and um, the yeah one thing one has to take care for is complexity in general. And um, normally, as I already told you, is um, the the general idea is you have theoretically driven selection of dimensions and levels. So based on literature and based on uh, connections that has been, have been mapped before, theoretically, um, one constructs different dimensions, different attributes that are important, and um, of course, uh, there are levels. But um, the problem is normally that we tend to, uh, at least in social sciences and sociology, that we tend to have um, um, many, you know, fruitful ideas, many dimensions are important. And um, many factors may play a role, and um, the problem is that you always have to make some some um, um, sorry some um, decisions about um, which are the real which are the dimensions that are really important because um, otherwise it gets too complex. And um, one one good way to to think about complexity is in the in the first um, uh, attempt you can always calculate. The, the vineyard universe or the full factorial, which is the um, orthogonal crossing of all dimensions. That means the Cartesian product. And in, in this case with four dimensions and three, three, four, four levels, we would have like 144 vineyards in the vineyard universe, right? And um, in, many, in many factorial survey studies and many applications, you will end up with um, a, a full factorial that is 100 one hundred thousands or even millions of, of, of vineyards. 
And uh, then you have to think about, okay, do I have to include all these um, dimensions? Is it really necessary? Is it really important for my, for my research project? Or do I um, produce too much noise? Do I produce a too complex design? And um, um, maybe I should reduce it. So the trade-offs one has to do uh, methodologically is, is, for example, if you have more dimensions and levels, you will get more information on the just judgment principles, which is good. You can test more hypotheses. You can yeah, dig deeper into substantive research. But uh, methodologically, the biggest problem is high cognitive burden of respondents. Um, you, um, uh, you see within the, within the factorial survey research, you see um, uh, factorial surveys that have like three levels, uh, uh, sorry, three dimensions, which is uh, under complex already, uh, almost design up to 25 was I think the most complex design I've ever seen at 25 dimensions within a vignette. And a vignette was as long as an abstract, right? So it's, it's really big. And the problem is um, people cannot digest all the information simultaneously, of course, um, and um, if the cognitive burden is too high, and this is also known from other methods research, people start using heuristics, right, to 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 um, to ease up the um, task, and um, then of course you can end up with some methodological problems, like people only focus on the last or on the first dimensions, and 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 fade out the the middle part because it was uh, too much, you know, too much information. Um, so, so one, one wouldn't, as a researcher, you would avoid, or you try to avoid, of course, cognitive overburden, um, or even underburden. So, so people who bore out, um, and try to, try to get a, um, a number of dimensions that is, yeah, appropriate. And on the other hand, if you have more, di more dimensions and levels, of course, the bigger is the vignette universe. And that means if you have like a million, uh, vignettes in your vignette universe and you want to sample it is it is maybe not enough to sample only 20 or 50 right because it will not it will not be a good sample of your of your full factorial you may you maybe need more vignettes or you need more respondents um and or, or people have to have to rate more vignettes so it is um it is always this trade of your uh, and the decisions you have to take care if you if you construct your your factorial survey and in, in our experience, so when I talk about our, uh, just uh, because I uh, realize I talk, uh, um, uh, yeah, when I, when I say our, so, so it is, I work on this um, uh, factorial survey research for about 13 years, and um, I do it not alone, but mostly with my partners in crime, Katrin Ausburg, Thomas Hinz, and Stefan Ludwig, so we did a lot of work together, so whenever I say we, I, 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 mean, um, I mean the four of us, or uh, some of them. So, um, but what we found out during the last years was that about like five to nine dimensions, something like this, is a is a is a good um, is a good number of dimensions that can uh, people can still handle it. So, so it is not too complex, it is not under complex, um, and people don't start to fade out. But what we found with with um, with more dimensions was in in um, general populations that, for example, older people or less well educated people started using heuristics to, um, to, to cope with a, with a complex situation. And also um, uh, aligned with the a, with a number of dimensions is of course important, the number of vignettes people have to evaluate, right? So if you, if you evaluate, let's say one vignette, you think like, ah, I could, I could evaluate the next one, and maybe then three, four, maybe 10, but then you get bored and then you think like, okay, this survey is, um, uh, you know, I want to move on. I want to do something different. And um, what we found is, so we, we did some experimental research where we provided up to 30 vignettes. So to really get the people angry, right? And uh, so our experience was that it, like up to 10 vignettes, in some cases you can use 12, but, 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 um, but not, not too much more because people start to use heuristics again and start to boil it down and to, to click through and, and yeah, to lose um, interest of it. Um, and uh, one way to, to reduce the, the complexity of these vignettes besides you know, reducing the number of vignettes, the number of dimensions is um, to, um, to keep out all unnecessary information that is maybe part of your experiment, but that is constant throughout the um, um, 
lineage. For example, in my case, when you think of these um, workers who work um, um, uh, who, uh, about the justice evaluation of their earnings, um, these people all work full time, right? And um, you didn't find it on the on the on the vignette because it would just be a waste of some some um, words. And and we put it at the beginning, in the introduction, and we told the people, okay, these are all full time working people. Okay, and so we, we, we had some basic information put in, put in front um, that people know, okay, these are full-time workers and they all work in Germany and they all um, have, um, I don't know, a, um, a permanent contract and, and that they only focus on things and, you know, you tell the people, okay, we only focus on things that change um, and you, you only have to evaluate them and keep in mind that these people are, for example, full-time. So keep out all the stuff that is constant. And regarding the numbers of levels, so the um, attributes have different levels. Some have more or less natural numbers of levels, right? When you think about gender, it is at least it is easy to have male, female. It, it is maybe uh, nowadays also more uh, to think about uh, more categories and to and to to to, um, uh, to open up this uh, economy. But but this is this is easier than, for example, age. Right, uh, a metric scale where we have to pick some values, and 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 you have to think about okay, what is it, it is maybe a non-linear connection. So I have to have to have to pick some values that make sense that can represent the the function later on. But uh, a general advice is to have a similar number of levels across dimensions to avoid the so-called number of levels effect. And this is um, an effect that um, people tend to be more keen or to, to focus more on things that change more often, right? So if you, if you evaluate like 10 vignettes in a row and some things change from vignette to vignette, you will, you will have an eye on this because you think like, oh, this is, this is the real interesting stuff and things that do not change so much, you will maybe fade out. So that it's, it's a good practice to, to have a, a similar number of levels, but it is not always possible um, in many cases, it's not possible. And, it, and I will tell you after, so in some minutes, I will tell you if, if this is not possible, then there are other strategies that you should at least use to, to, to keep the design consistent. Um, we have, um, um, so, so when, when, when I talk about pe um, um, people's projects um, about factorial service. I always start with a with a very low number of of levels, for example, and then I say, okay, what is the justification to add up? So, what is the theoretical or methodological justification to be more complex and not to be super complex at the beginning and to to boil it down, but to, but to think, okay, what is what is something I really need, and then um, I will I will okay I will say okay for the sake of uh, substantive research, we will we will lose up with a, a, a little bit with a methodological perfect design but end up with a with a little bit uh, less less good design but but because of the research question right and this is always the, the way one one can think about it to to keep it concise and to keep it um, um easy compact um if possible of course uh, the avoidance of illogical cases is 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 very good because an implausible combination so so there was a discussion in the literature so keeping for example um, um, medical doctors with without university degree in your in your factorial design um, because you know it is part of this vignette world. But our research on on um, implausible cases was don't do it because people seem to think like it is a mistake, a typo, or whatever, and start to fade out the dimensions and 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 um, concentrate on other things that vary. And this is again a methodological problem you you won't want to have. Um, so when we when we in the next step come to the presentation style. So when we think about now when we think about complexity is the one thing. The other thing is how to present my my vignettes. And the um, biggest question is I think uh, text versus table, of course. Um, the, most of the vignettes use of uh, t uh, text representation. This is because we think it's more natural to read a to read a full text, a full sentence. And this is um, where the vignettes come from 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 Peter. Rossi and and Williamina Yasso and people who always use this um, um, text. But on the other hand, when you have like similar methods like the um, conjoint analysis and, and choice experiments and stuff, um, which use similar methods, um, uh, they always use this table representation. And um, some researchers did did some research about it, and and so far we didn't find any so 
two big differences between the two ways of um, um, presentation. So, so it maybe depends on the on the research topic, but but there's so far no evidence that that uh, you you ruin your design when you use a table vignette, and it can be useful in cases when you try to um, try to overcome order effects of dimensions. Yeah, and um, in general, uh, in a, in a regular sentence, you you cannot put a word where you want it, right? It, it has its natural position in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a sentence. So when you, when you have like a 35 year old man works as a construction worker. So you, you wouldn't say a construction worker um, is a man and he's 35, yeah, right? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, manipulate the order. You, I mean, you can, but it, but, but it sounds not well. And people would say, okay, this is a crazy survey, right? But what we do actually is when we do not randomize stuff and you will, you will see it throughout the talk. When you do not randomize stuff, you will have some order effects. Always, you will you will always have something. Okay, gender is always at the beginning, so people maybe are focused more on this than on other stuff. But if you have a tabular representation, you can of course vary the the um, dimension order. Um, the suggestion would be always between subjects, not within subjects, because then people get mess messed up. But um, but um, between subjects absolutely possible and then you have another so to speak randomization another thing that is orthogonal in your in your design which is quite nice so it might be helpful um second thing we we checked um um in in uh, experimental research was uh, in methods research was um is it useful to have a random order of vignettes when you have multiple vignettes for a respondent or extreme cases first because if you if you use random order, people can run out of scale, right? If if you if you have some extreme vignette at the very end and people already use the minus five, you have a ceiling effect when you when you have a closed scale. But um, so so it, it it would be maybe a good thing to use extreme cases first to have like the the the, the outer parts of of the distribution fixed. But our research showed no no um, no qualitative change in in, in anything, so we would um, stay uh, uh, with a random order suggestion. So um, if you if you have multiple vignettes per respondent, use a random order of vignettes. And um, if you don't use it, you will have order effects, right? So the first vignette people are uh, read it totally different than the last vignette. And you see it here. I have a graph. And this is for um, this is median um, response time in seconds, and this is from the vignette zero. So we call the first vignette zero. It's a little bit crazy, but um, vignette zero to vignette twenty. And for the different types of rating and different scales we use, but but I just want to show you the pattern. The pattern here is the first vignette takes fifty percent, up to one hundred percent more time than the the other vignette. So people need an adjustment so they read the first one and are a little bit lost and then when when they cope with it then they rate the other ones relatively um, um easily and um therefore um therefore you you, you already see okay that there, there, there will be some order effects going on right so people people are more um, um, um will rate uh, the first vignette maybe differently than the tenth and um in case this is uh, uh yeah if it is the case um, um, the the random order of of vignettes will uh, will um, um, will guarantee that your method effects are not correlated are not not um, um, connected to your substantive effects right so this is always uh, very important and of course um, um, if you have your vignette you always need an answering scale you have a, um, a dependent variable you have a measure you're interested in. And um, there are different scales out there, of course, like nominal scales, like yes, no, you can have amounts, probabilities, um, um, classical uses rating scales, so standard rating scales. And you will also find the literature many open or magnitude scales, um, which I don't, I don't want to go into detail here because it's, it's, it's like a little bit complicated to explain. But um, bottom line of our research, methods research is um, use rating scales or you know like easy scales people people use in other parts of the survey already like five point seven point scales um, um that people can handle because um, um otherwise you have higher non-response you have dropout rates and you have less consistent um, um, um results so the the so to speak the standard design is is uh, based on our research the the best design 
Okay, so and 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 now you have your um, um, you have your vignettes, right? And um, now it it really gets interesting when you think about um, um, how to choose an experimental design. So this is, so to speak, the key part of this talk, I, I would say, and also um, I think. I guess the key part of, of, of some of you who do this research and who are maybe uh, currently into developing stuff, this is maybe the, where, where the biggest problems are, I, I, I would guess. And um, <clears throat> I, would, I would start with this, with this, um, with this citation um, of, of um, Louvier and he says, research should recognize that the designs chosen, researchers, I'm sorry, should recognize that the designs chosen are at least as, if not more important than the models that one uses to analyze the resulting data. And this is really, a, this is a good um, quote because I think th 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 this this totally fits to my experience. So if you, if you screwed up the design, you can have the coolest um, analysis techniques later on, cool multi-level random slopes, whatever. But 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 you you would still have this data with some bugs in it. And otherwise, if you if you have a nice um, a, a nice experimental setup, you can you can end up with robust uh, OLS regression or, or, um, or whatever clustered clustered regressions, and you will end up with the same results that you that you have with, with more fancy methods because it is such a robust uh, design. Yeah. And um, so it is. It is always a, It is always important to 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 do this um, thinking about experimental the experimental um, setup before in yeah in an advanced way. I mean, for those of you who do um, experimental research, um, anyways, it is it is uh, daily business, right? I come from the from the survey research, and um, I, I think it is it is really some. It is it is as um, different to to the regular um, um, survey construction because you you will put even more effort into thinking of of your design before. Um, yeah, and and uh, what is important is that the design determines the parameter identification. That means which parameters are estimatable, which main effects, which interaction effects, and stuff like this. All will be set up before even one respondent had evaluated it. Uh, the model flexibility and the statistical efficiency of resulting estimates. So this is all you have to consider before. And of course, there's no way to improve an experimental design once you conducted your survey, of course, right? And so that's why it is um, um, important to, to get it done correctly. And I will start here with an, with an example. So you um, may imagine a factorial survey with four dimensions. So, you know, like an easy one, like gender, age, um, occupation and um, performance, whatever. So think of four dimensions, and these dimensions have two, three, four, and six levels per dimensions. So we would first calculate the, the full factorial, and this is um, 144 uh, possible combinations. And um, I now drew, for, for, for example purposes, I drew a sample of 20, yeah, a random sample. So we start with an easy random sample. And I hope everybody can, can see it. So you have the left panel here and the, and the right panel and the left one is for the full factorial and the, and the right one is for the, for the sample. And um, um, I, 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 will, I will show now the, the terms orthogonality and balance, which will become um, important in a second. Um, when, you, when you look at the correlation between the main effects, x1, to uh, so the dimensions x1, x2, x3, x4, in the full factorial, you see there is zero correlation, of course. Uh, this is how it should be. It's an orthogonal design. And um, this is orthogonality, right? And when you draw a sample, when you go now to the, to the, to the right, you see, okay, we have correlation here, 0. 0.1455 and, and stuff like this. So it is just um, um, correlation. And why? Because whenever I sample, um, I create correlation. I cannot, I cannot avoid it. It's, 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 um, it, it, it will create correlation. And the, um, and the um, question will be um, in some minutes, um, is the correlation problematic? Is it problematically high? And is it problematic because um, it is between key features we want to measure? But I will show you in a second. And, um, and this is basically orthogonality, the, the question about orthogonality. And um, if we go to the panel below, 
you see the frequencies for a variable x1. We have um, this variable x1 or dimension x1 has two levels and you see here 72, 72. So that means um, they add up to 144, makes perfectly sense. And this is called balance. So the levels are perfectly balanced. And for all of you who know, who are deep into um, and regression analysis, um, whenever, the more balanced, the more efficient are my coefficients, right? If you, if you have um, um, a variable, for example, if you have part-time men and only 5% of the men are part-time employees, you will have trouble to estimate um, 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 efficiently your, your coefficient on, on, on part-time working men because they are only a few, right? So, um, and in our experimental design, we want to have a, 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 the balance to have, um, to, to have a high efficiency. In the sample, of course, on the on the right side, it could end up it couldn't end up balanced, but it so it, it could end up, it could end up differently. In our in my case, I have um, um, level one six times and level two fourteen times. So it's it's not manipulated by me. It's actual sampling process, and it can happen. So this is imbalance, right? So it's not balanced anymore, and this is not nice because you you have different powers, so to speak, to to um, estimate. Um, the two levels, and um, <clears throat> so so this was this was about orthogonality and balance, and we get back to this in a second, and um, um, to to just raise the bar to 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 get more complex, um, this is now the term of, of of confounding, and this is so to speak the last term in this in this uh, um, um, sampling procedure, um, and and what does confounding mean, and um, I, I will. I'm show you when when you see this table here. We have now um, three variables: d1, d2, and d3, and these are um, um, like dimensions with two levels. And we coded them orthogonally, and this is plus one and minus one coded. So you maybe know dummy coding zero one, but but this is also a possible coding scheme plus one minus one, with a with a nice uh, effect that you can calculate all the uh, that you can see. Um, the the correlation patterns between um, higher uh, two-way and higher interactions, and um, between three variables with um, um, two levels each, you will have eight possible combinations. Right? You have uh, the main effects. You have the two-way interactions between d1 and d2, d1 and d3, d2 and d3, and you have the three-way interaction. This is all you can potentially um, estimate. And um, you, you see, just for, for an example, um, I'm calculating the, the um, effect for, for the two-way interaction D1, D2 is minus one times minus one is plus one, of course. And for the next one, it's minus one times plus one is minus one. And for the three-way interaction, it's minus one times minus one times plus one, you end, you end up with plus one, obviously. So if you, if you now um, um, use this scheme, if you, if you now use this as a, as a full factorial, you can estimate all main effects, all two-way interactions, and all three-way interactions in, um, in your survey. But now let's think of taking a fraction, yeah? taking a sample out of this full factorial. It, I mean, it's an easy example. It will, it will be more complex in your research, but, but just to, to, to get it, uh, to get the problem. So, and in our case, we would choose you know, by, by random sampling, the first half fraction. And um, so, so one, two, three, four, it's now a sample of four vignettes. And in this, in this um, um, sample, you were unable to distinguish the two models. The first one is a main effects model of D1, D2, and D3. And the second one is a model of um, two-way interactions. And when you, when you look at um, the, the, patterns I, ho I hope you you can you can see it for example um, um, um pl minus minus plus plus and here you have plus plus minus minus so d2 times d3 it has the same pattern as d1 and um, minus plus minus plus minus plus minus plus this has the same pattern as d2 and when you think of d3 plus one minus minus plus has the same pattern as d1 times d2, right? So if, if somebody has the hypothesis 
that um, um, it is the connection between, um, you know, the, the evaluations are based on the factors one, two, and three. And the colleague of yours has the counter hypothesis that is, it is the um, sum of the two and two way and uh, three two way interactions. You will not end up with, a, with this design with a, with a clear um, um, answer because it can be both. And this is confounding, right? This is the, so to speak, the problem of confounding. And it is no problem if you do it by purpose and if you know that it is no problem. But it is a problem if you don't do it by purpose, but you do it anyways whenever you sample and, um, um, and, you, don't, uh, and you are not aware of it and you will, will end up with trouble later. Okay, so I hope, I hope this, this was um, understandable. Um, um, if not, we can, we can of course uh, talk about this. Uh, later, but um, um, so um, so and, and when we now go back to the to the active you know sampling process, when you as a researcher want to sample, you have to keep these things in mind. You 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 always end up with some confounding, and you and you want to have the the um, full knowledge. What do you what is the what is the founding? What is going on? What is what are the parameters that are estimatable and what are the parameters that are not identifiable anymore? And this is something which is very important because otherwise you end up with a design that could be interpreted this way or the other way. And um, this is so to speak the most important thing. You have to get a knowledge what are the meaningful parameters that are identifiable, which are not confounded. And um, the second thing then is, um, um, or no, sorry. Um, so only parameters that can be expected to show neglectable effects or effect sizes close to zero might be confounded. Or um, um, when you when you have a design that not, not only has like two levels, but maybe three, four levels for dim um, and per dimension and many dimensions more, you will not only have three-way interactions, but maybe also five, six, seven, um, way interactions, and I guess there's no theory out there that uh, that uh, uh, that that claims that these interactions are still valid. So you you could, by design, confound these higher order interactions with with main or with uh, second order interactions because you know they are not relevant anyways. Yeah, but this is a process. That this is an active process. You would do by by de by design, and you would decide it. Um, in in sociology, at least, we we have in. So the theories I know, they, they end up with like mostly two level interactions. So theoretically, sometimes maybe three level interactions, but um, yeah, it, it doesn't get more complicated, I guess. And then if you, if you get this clear in the first step, you will secondly think about minimizing correlations and that means orthogonality and maximize the variance of level balance. And this is increase efficiency or power. But it's the second step, of course. The first one is a valid design. Second step is a good design or a very good design. And um, this is all I, all I tell you now is, is the, the um, or what I told you now is the problem is particular, uh, particularly big when you have a small fraction. If you have a, if you have a, like if you only draw like 10 vignettes or stuff like this, uh, or uh, like this, then you, you end up with um, um, confounding that you need to control and that you need to care for. And um, there are now different random, uh, uh, sorry, there are now different sampling strategies. And um, some of these strategies um, will leave it by chance if you have a confounding pattern that is good or bad, and some doesn't. Uh, some don't leave it by chance, right? And the first one, when when you do random sampling, you leave it by chance. Of course, you just pick some 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 vignettes, and um, it could be if you have these eight vignettes and you and you draw these four, uh, um, um, as I showed you before, this could be. This could happen with a simple random sampling and you would end up with a confounded design. Um, it will not be a big problem if you have bigger samples, but um, in this case it could be. So, so random sampling is okay, but it is dangerous if you have small samples. And uh, the other option is so-called de-efficient sampling. So there are also others, uh, um, fractional plans and designs, but I will skip all this um, because the, what is, what is, Nowadays used or in, in, in uh, vineyard studies or factorial surveys is the de-efficient sampling. And this is um, an algorithm that maximizes orthogonality and level balance by, um, yeah, uh, by uh, 
huge um, um, calculation processes and, and, and therefore finds maybe not the optimal design, but, an, but a good design. Um, and in this design, in this way of, of, of sampling, this de-efficient sampling, you would have the uh, control over which effects become confounded. You specify, I want um, non-confounded main effects, I want non-confounded non uh, two-way interactions, and I maybe want a non-confounded three-way interaction because of this and this hypothesis, right? And um, um, you would specify it before, that makes it more complicated, but on the other hand, you end up with a, with a um, design that allows you to test for this stuff. On the other hand, again, the downside is if you didn't control it, it may be confounded and then you cannot end up with an explorative hypothesis uh, tested because then you have maybe this confoundation pattern I showed you before and uh, then you then you think, oh, this, this could be problematic in interpretation. So you, you would need all the hypothesis you want to test, you would need before you even go into the field, as I told you before, because you would, you would um, 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 take care of them in the sampling plan. Um, and and just, uh, just to give you a, um, idea of what is the efficiency? It is um, um, these is the determinant. It's it's determinant efficiency actually, and it's the measurement that jointly captures the both criteria of orthogonality and level balance. This is the I, I just uh, uh, I wrote down the formula, and um, um, wh what you see here is that the the inverse x prime x matrix, the the um, determinant. You see the determinant um, um, of the x prime x matrix, and um, this is basically what is optimized. And the key feature of a of a of a determinant um, going to one, uh, or, you know, asymptotically, um, is that it is orthogonal and balanced. So so it it optimizes the key features by optimizing the determinant of the matrix. Just just for for the for the background. Um, and um, the, the, the problem now is the realization of these the efficient designs, right? So um, it is, it is um, um, not, not too easy. So it is, it is not, so there are some, there's some stuff implemented, for example, in, in, in Stata, there's also some, some program in the implemented SPSS, for example, I, I checked it some years ago, but, um, but, but, but it is not comparable to, to real de-efficient designs. And, and the best algorithm I know is, is um, provided by SIS, by SAS software. And um, um, the, the guy who wrote this, Marco, is Warren Kufeld from Australia. And, um, um, the the cool thing with SAS is so it is I mean it is a, pro a program many people don't like of course and and I also have my problem with it with it but the cool thing is um, this is um, available also online now for academics so you can use SAS of on demand for for academics for free and then you can for example sample with a with a with a uh, SAS software you can you can sample your um, de efficient design and then download it as an Excel table and then use R or use data or whatever software you use to further process this data set. So um, my recommendation always is to use SAS if you, if you, if you want to go with a de-efficient design. Um, I always, I, I sometimes check other software, but still it is, it is I think, the most powerful algorithm. Um, and in this, um, um, in, in, in this vein, if you, if you do de-efficient designs, it is a good advice to have all dimensions with similar numbers of level, as I, as I said before, or at least they should be multiples of each other. Uh, so, so, so use two, four and eight instead of two, three and eight levels, because it is of course more easy to have an orthogonal you know, design if, if, if everything is a multiple of each other. So it's mathematically easier then if you, if you have uh, two, three, maybe five levels, eight levels, so you, so, so you end up um, um, with, with, with a situation where the algorithm takes longer and finds, um, um, uh, has more difficulties to find a, a diff the efficient design. Of course, there is not always an optimal design, a perfect design. In many cases in sociology, there will not be a perfect design, but um, um, a relatively good design, right? So we always compare different designs with each other and we will, take the best one, which is not the optimal design because it is sometimes not possible, right? Um, <clears throat> when you have illogical cases, you have to exclude. Um, because as I told you in the example, 
when you have education and occupation in Germany, occupation and education are correlated, right? And you cannot tell people this is a doctor without a university degree, it's not possible. So you need to exclude illogical combinations. And um, with this, uh, when you use this um, algorithm, you would do it simultaneously. So you specify uh, in the command, you specify already um, which are the um, illogical combinations or implausible combinations and you then, the, the algorithm um, does it simultaneously. So, so um, getting rid of the logical combinations and optimizing. Um, so the, the, the worst advice is to delete these illogical combinations afterwards, which is no problem, I guess, for, for, for random sampling, um, but which would totally destroy your de-efficient design um, um, when you use these algorithms. Um, and what is often used, what is often recommended is um, the so-called resolution five designs. And these are um, designs that allow the orthogonality of all main effects. This is a basic, of course, and all two-way interactions. Then you're on the safe side. But it's, it's not always possible depending on, on, on the respective design. And um, just, to, just to close this part, um, you see a figure here, um, and I hope it's, it's still readable, but, but there are two lines. This, this is um, um, the efficiency on the y-axis. You see the de-efficiency, um, which ranges from zero, super inefficient to 100, super efficient. And you see on the x-axis, the number of um, um, vignettes, so the number of cases. And um, what you can see here, if you use a de-efficient algorithm, you can easily, even with small samples, reach um, a very nice design, uh, a very, um, with a very high D efficiency, yeah? And um, with random sampling, you start with a lousy design, yeah? And that's why I told you earlier, so if you have a very small, if you, if you just wanna have a small sample, you run into problems with random samples because they have a low efficiency. But as you see, if you use bigger samples, like, like 100 or 200, and then um, the difference between random sampling and de-efficient sampling is not that big, and that means if you if you uh, if you are currently in a situation where you where you have to go into the field and you are not you know super um, familiar with a with a de-efficient programming and maybe have some problems, it is it is maybe a good advice to go with a random design in case you have a large number of of um, um, samples. Okay, so um, so this was the was the um, m most complicated part. I just want to just want to add two two other points, and and one is um, about the survey modes. So because this is always a question, um, um, how do we, uh, uh, which is the best way to 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 survey these vignettes? Um, and we tested all different uh, or many many um, um, survey um, uh, alternatives and. Um, the, the the question would be if you use copy that means computer assisted personal interviewing is is all right but people but um, um, interviewers shouldn't read the vignette to the person right uh, because the interview will read all the other texts but it it, sh it should not be the case for the vignettes because it is different what what you hear you you even lose more information than than if you see so um, at least for the Case, this should be self-administered and people so we have always like a when we program it with an advice or a, a, a note to the to the interviewer that says okay now tr uh, turn the screen or give this give the computer to the to the respondent and that the respondent can do it on on their own um yeah and for this reason we also do not recommend to have telephone interviews with vignettes at least when it's too complicated you you really have to boil down the dimensions of course i mean the telephone is is even worse maybe in sound audio quality stuff like this so one has to consider it is um it can it can lead to more problems but um i don't have too much um, methodological um um evidence here it is it is just um it, it hasn't been done so much so far um the the good thing with with online interviews and 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 computer assisted interviews is of course that you can implement the question as easily and can randomize the versions right the the order easily there's also there's also ways in party interviews we also did it with with uh, serial letter functions in word you can you can also use uh, them to to randomize the um the questionnaires but it's of course easier with a with a um online um, tools
Um, of course, what is crucial in all uh, situations, the vignettes should be randomly allocated to respondents because otherwise you will have a um, um, correlation between um, um, characteristics of the respondent and features of the factorial survey and this will affect your design obviously and um, um, there should be of course um, a unique ident identification of the vignette rated by different respondents um, that is included into the response data um, of course for merging reasons for, for matching reasons um, and again, the question with or without interviewer, it is, it is uh, still in debate, but um, if an, an interview can be helpful in our experience, but these interviewers have been, should, have, should have some training because um, it, is, it is not a classical question they use. They, they, um, people say, oh, this is not realistic, this is artificial, and, 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 and the interviewer has to say, okay, this is, a, you, you know, this is not maybe your experience, but this is a, you know, the researchers have made their thoughts, whatever you can say, but, but, but the interviewers should be trained to, to have the right answers for these questions. Um, otherwise, interviews are, are, are worse than, than um, without interviews. Um, but even if with interviewers, the model should be, the module should be self-administered. And um, our experience with different um, data sets with self-administered and so with and without interviewer data lead to more or less the same qu data quality. So we didn't find any big differences. <clears throat> and um, just here, uh, just here to, to see, okay, how, how much time do you have to calculate for putting your module in it? So we did it for five, eight and 12 dimensions with 10, 20 and, and, and 30 vignettes and if you, you know, it's always about survey time. It's always about time and money, right? And and you get, maybe get a spot uh, in a in a in a survey. So sometimes I get a spot in a survey from I don't know a colleague, and and then they say, okay, give you two minutes, and then I use this table to to think about, okay, I can maybe go with eight vignettes or something like this, yeah. And as I showed you before, the first vignette takes the longest time, thirty seconds, even one minute, but then it 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 really gets easier later. Okay, and then um, um, we, move, we move to the, to the last um, um, part now, when you have your data um, and, and it comes to data analysis, um, um, wh what to do now? The, I think the, um, the challenging part is, is the data preparation. That means the reshaping and um, the merging because um, you have um, data, when you, when you have multiple vignettes per respondent, you will have a long format and you need to merge the experimental setup to the, to the, um, um, to the survey data, the respondent data set. And this is always, yeah, as, as, as you know, always a little bit tricky. And um, so um, there need to be some quality checks if, if this um, merging uh, was successful for all parts of the survey. And um, if it was successful, then one can go on uh, and, and think about, okay, did I, did, did the um, random distribution mechanism, um, did it work? So did all respondents, or do we have some specific uh, missing value patterns? Do we have implausible um, 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 results that maybe suggest that there's some, some, something went wrong with the, with the merging or with the reshaping or stuff like this? And, um, also, the question is, is the realized design similar to the design I gave into the world, right? So if we, for example, have a design, um, a theoretical design of, of 100 vignettes and, and your realized design, you, you recognize, oh, only 80 vignettes were um, evaluated and 20, for whatever reason, were not evaluated, then your realized design is different than your, than your theoretical a priori design. And then you, 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 you have to figure out what, what, is, what is going on, what happened, yeah? So this is all the checks one has to do before. When it comes to the real data analysis or the regression data analysis, um, there is nothing different than um, um, uh, you know already for analysis with similar data. So when you have between subjects designs, classical OLS logic, depending on the dependent variable, is is um, um, appropriate. And in the within subject design, meaning multiple ratings per respondents, you obviously have to go for at least clustered regressions, robust regressions, but also all the multi-level regression models that are, you know, available. Um, in case randomization 
um, was successful, your, um, that means the, the respondent characteristics are totally uncorrelated with the experimental setup. The difference between fixed and random effects uh, will not be there, right? So there will be no, no difference. So the random effects regressions will be more efficient. But you can also use this to check if there's something going on, some differences. And then um, <clears throat> what is more specific is, is for, for um, factorial service is to, to, to do some cross-level interactions, to do some group difference, uh, to do some analysis about group differences and stuff like this. And also what we, what we like um, uh, in many ways is, is um, uh, the, the estimating trade-offs, part worth, cross elasticities. And that means uh, like the willingness to pay. And, and for this, you need a monetary variable like, like earnings in my case at the beginning and a dummy variable like gender. And then you can, you can sort of be calculate what is the willingness to pay for example, the men more, you know, and, or the woman more, and you can, um, uh, you can, you can, um, you can estimate the part worth um, for different um, dimensions, which is interesting, which is uh, uh, which can be very instructive in Stata. So I don't know it in R, but in Stata there's this willingness to pay um, a do, which is very nice for the analysis. So th this is something which is especially useful for the analysis of factorial surveys. Okay, cool. So I will I will conclude because I'm I'm already I think uh, I, I talk already uh, sometime. So um, the construction of vignettes, um, you always have to think about the cognitive limitations um, to process information. So don't go too far because then the whole project is in danger because people start to have the heuristics and start to you know, use some strategies that you interpret theoretically in, in, in terms of your theory, but which are actually um, 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 method effects. Um, when it comes to vignette sampling, efficiency and confounding, I told you, okay, when you have a small sample, go for the efficient sampling. If you have a bigger sample, it maybe doesn't uh, matter, but yeah, still the best is the efficient sampling. Um, the random allocation to respondents and the random order of vignettes is, is important, is key, always randomization that, that keeps an experiment an experiment. Um, the prevention of implausible combinations is, is always a good thing because, um, if you use them in your survey, people think you are crazy, maybe. And if you um, 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 put them out before, you increase correlation. So, so even before you think about your, um, when, you, when you already think about your dimensions and levels, you should think, ah, maybe I shouldn't use, in a German context, I, I shouldn't use education and, and, and occupation in the same vignette because uh, occupations are so much connected to, to, to uh, education. So it's, it's maybe not a, not a good strategy. And of course, uh, in the data analysis, the considering of the hierarchical data structure. And um, yeah, that was my talk. Um, I hope it was um, nice for you and um, I'm happy for questions. Great, thank you so much, Karsten. Um, we now have roughly 20 minutes for Q&A. So we'll open the floor to questions and comments from the audience. And I just posted the logistics in the Zoom chat. So we have Johanna Gierecke here, who is raising her hand. So Johanna, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. Can you hear me now? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Carsten. I uh, really enjoyed the talk and, and learned a lot. <laughs> Um, I have three um, short questions. One is about um, how you showed that the first vignette always is rather special. It takes people longer to process it, to understand it. Um, would a solution or is a solution maybe also just to kick out all first questions and start the analysis sort of with vignette two? Um, the second question is, um, is there a way to identify, I mean, we know that in survey research generally, um, there is often a problem with trawling and speeding. Is there a way um, that we can also detect that in, um, in a, within a subject design where you have several vignettes? Um, and how, how do we handle those analytically? And the third question is, um, um, have you tried out or is there some evidence um, of um, using an open question at the end to find out in how far people understand the purpose of the vignettes um, and at what point maybe they also understand the purpose of the vignette. Um, yeah, thank you. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so, so regarding the first vignette, um, it is specific, uh, especially when it comes to processing time. Um, and, um, you know, people ask questions to the, to the, to the interview and stuff like this. But um, in all data I've seen, um, um, it was not specific um, in regard to the, to, the, to the judgments. So I would not suggest to kick out the first one because it doesn't seem to be a specific pattern that you know you, you try to avoid. So it's just, it's, it's more like you, you, you would have to think about, oh, it, it will take more time. So it is, if you use one or two vignettes, it, it doesn't really matter, so to speak, in, in, in terms of timing, because um, the, the first one always takes so, so much longer than the other ones. Um, regarding the second, um, so yeah, we use uh, identification strategy, strategy, strategy sorry, for, for feeding and stuff. Um, the, the, um, um, what we did in, or what we always do in the, in the uh, online surveys is that we have a timestamp that we um, actually, you know, measure how long do they take to, to evaluate the task. And um, <clears throat> if you are like two standard deviations below the, the standard time or something like this, and then, you know, we maybe red flag it and, and we can, we can uh, take a look at what is, what is going on here. Um, <clears throat> what I always would suggest, uh, so, so this is, um, is let the people the option to skip. So some, some, some surveys are forced, this is a forced um, um, answering, uh, forced, um, decision service right and you, you have to make a you have to make a decision anyways and um, and this will lead to, to to low quality data so I did it in a, in a very first study of mine in 2008 I, I forced the people to answer and um, I ended up with some some people who, who had some nice patterns you know evaluation patterns but but not uh, not not substantively but uh, due to I don't know um, they were angry um, um, of, of, of answering. So I would always allow, so even if you have it, even if you, if you um, don't allow it in the other parts of the survey, I would allow it there because it's better to have a, um, a missing value than, than an angry um, respondent who, who evaluates nonsense. And then there's this control for speeding. And, and what we um, also do is um, use two um, measures. One is for example, like a B coefficient is uh, like a, like a Z score or a T value or so, and you look how does it develop throughout your your like ten vignettes. So is there any break or is there any structural break that you can see? Okay, this obviously didn't matter um, after the eighth vignette. Is there something going on? Is it because of my design? Is it because people were bored out, or is it because um, I don't know what strategies? And the other one, which is uh, and this is. The, um, um, uh, so this is what we do, and the other one is 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 um, recommended in the literature um, is the R square. So look at the the uh, explained variance, for example, or some other measure, and to see is is there any you know um, any difference in the in the explained variance throughout the survey. But I would I would always say okay, this is this you can use this, but always with caution because um, I can produce super high R squares with only focusing on one or two dimensions. But, but when I'm super consistent uh, for in, in regard to these two dimensions, I will produce um, um, a high R square. So this is, all, so, you know, just, just that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one way to, to analyze uh, the quality of the data, but it shouldn't be the only way because uh, it still doesn't detect it. So I would combine it with looking at T values and looking, you know, set scores, whatever for, uh, your, your model is for different, um, um, for different dimensions and for different parts of the of the survey. <clears throat> okay, and the and the last question was the open question at the end. So so I mean, there's um, I always did in my survey a question regarding, do you think it was too complex? Or what what is what is your um, perception? Was it was it um, all right? Was it too complex? Was it too easy? So so to have like um, an evaluation of of um, um, yeah, did I go too far? Was it too no, too much? I mentioned stuff like this. Um, but in your case, you would use it more like a like I think like a like a control. If people um, um, understood what you really wanted, and I mean, it depends on you know, is it is it like is it something you you want to measure and people shouldn't be aware of? And then of course you can do this test afterwards, and it's it's no problem. 
Um, but in many cases, it's maybe not even um, um, applicable because um, it, it is not a key problem in, in the survey. But it would be absolutely okay, but everything, so to speak, after the, after the task. And, and also sometimes you have looked like a vineyard task and then some other stuff and some, then other vineyards. Um, it's always important to put some time in between and some other questions in between to not have this strong framing effect of the first vineyards, right? So, yeah. All right, thanks for that. We have six more questions. Uh, the first of which comes from Gracia Bergman, who will ask her questions via audio. So Gracia, please feel free to speak. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I had a question regarding uh, which sample size is large enough in order not to use the D efficient uh, design. And I had a more general question, which I had written before, but could read now. Um, if you just would do one repetition because your sample size is large and you don't have um, that many dimensions and levels, would it still be a vignette experiment? I mean, this is probably more general question, so I should have asked it first, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, um, so, so there is, there is um, regarding the, the sample size and the, um, um, uh, and the, you know, this distinguishing between deficient designs, random, random designs, uh, random sampling, there's no clear answer because it depends on um, how many dimensions and levels you have. So it, it actually depends on your, on your field for full factorial, right? So if you, if you have a full factorial that is, um, that is maybe 16 or 20 or whatever, um, it is a different decision than when you have uh, um, um, a full factorial of, of three million or stuff like this. In, sure. So, so that means if you have a um, if you have a very small um, vineyard universe, I would always suggest to maybe do the full factorial. Do not even sample, you know, out of forty to sample uh, twenty or thirty, but to, to do the to, to use the full factorial because you 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 end up with an easy design. You have no problems with sampling strategies, and you can uh, estimate all possible combinations, anyways. Yep. In the other case, if you have like a, like hundreds of thousands or or millions, um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, you would maybe draw some random samples and you can look at the sample structure. And what you always can do with, with random samples too, is um, you, you, would, you would write down your hypothesis, right? Your, your, mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, what are the claims regarding the main effects and the potential interactions? And then you would create, and maybe you think about an interaction of X1 and X2, and then you mm -hmm. have a random sample, you create a variable X1 times X2, and then you look at the correlations. You, what you didn't do is you didn't purposefully um, draw a sample, yeah, the efficient sample that, that avoids uh, um, um, confounding, but you can check afterwards if, if there's confounding. So, so you, would, you would maybe draw a random sample and before you go in the field, you would, you would check, um, is there a problem with the higher order effects I wanna estimate? And if so, you would throw it away and you would draw the next random sample. It is not an efficient, you know, it's, it's not an efficient mm -hmm. way to, do, to go for, but, but if you ask me, if you, if, you, if you go for the random sample, which is, which is okay, but I would suggest that, that you follow the same procedure, doing mm -hmm. all the hypothesis before and just look, is it even estimatable, um, sure. um, you know, bef before you go on the field. And the other one, the question about the, the one vignette um, design, um, at least in sociology, so when you, when you, when you have um, a between subjects design, you, you can, of course, do no analysis on the, on the respondent level, on uh, respondent specific terms, but normally we are interested in, you know, differences between different groups, like older, younger, different age groups, different occupation groups and stuff like this. And um, the only thing different is that you, that you don't have this within um, <clears throat> experiment, but still it's an experiment because because it is still manipulated. There's different, the, the, there's still randomization and the treatment, so to speak, is randomly allocated to the respondents. It is less, uh, so, so you have less power because of less cases, uh, because of fewer cases, but it's still an experiment. Okay. Or survey experiment, at least. But it's not called win yet in that case. Excuse me? But not called win yet. Um, no, if you, if you, if you have um, like this, like, like this, 
No, if you uh, maybe I misunderstood you. So, so I was I was talking about a one vignette per respondent design. If you only yeah. have one vignette at all, it is not a. It is no, not no, a, one per respondent. Sorry, I mean, you were right. You were completely right. Yes, then it is still an experiment because you still allocate. Um, 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 you know, you still have one thousand different questionnaires because you have one thousand different combinations of this vignette, for example. And mm -hmm. when you have your regular survey, you have one questionnaire, and so you're still in the. Okay. In, the, in the experimental world, yeah. Good, thanks. Yep. All right, thank you. Next up is Ruben Bach, who will also ask his questions via audio. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting presentation. I have a question regarding the uh, presentation of results. So um, I was in a situation where there was no base category or reference category. And so we were like, it took us a long time to figure out how to best present the results because like a standard regression model wouldn't make sense in the end we ended up comparing means of different uh, scenarios but obviously you run into situations of multiple testing and so I was wondering if you have any recommendations on that. Yes, um, <clears throat> so so it depends. So if you, if you have like, um, like uh, a dimension that has three levels um, lower, middle, and higher secondary school, you would go for the, um, I guess, go for the design that you have one um, reference category. So you have this uh, dummy coded design. Um, as you know it from, from regular regressions, uh, um, um, regression tables. And if you have um, a metric variable like age, and you have, for, for example, four or five age categories, and you can you can check if there's a if, if if it has a linear pattern. So if it is not a not a not a uh, I don't know any other pattern, you can just uh, throw in the the coefficient and just interpret it as as the metric variable you would you would interpret it in the in the regular survey. Um, and what I would suggest is um, I mean I, at the beginning I some so you, you know you can you can always think about um, um, doing something like this, where you, where you, for example, um, um, show the effect of, in this case, gender, in, um, um, in terms of money, right? So everybody can read it, or in terms of percentage changes of earnings and stuff like this. So I would, I would suggest to think about, um, and maybe it's possible in, in your data set, to, to, to play around with this willingness to pay um, 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 feature and, and to um, then graphically or, or in any way represent your data that, that makes it more accessible to the reader. So I would, I would suggest to, to, to play around with this. Cool, thank you. Yep. All right, perfect. The next question was posted by Paul Miners in the Zoom chat, so I'm gonna read it out. Do you think stimulus sampling is a good idea for factorial survey experiments? The conjoint literature has recently started to use representative samples of vignettes that reflect the real distribution in order to improve external validity. Social psychologists do the same, for example, when selecting faces for a social cognition experiment. Does this introduce problems for internal validity? Okay. Um, so my... Um... Oh, that, I, I can't. Actually, I can't answer this. I, I, I'm not sure about um, 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 yeah, a correct answer because my experience is that um, in the conjoint literature, the um, the um, sampling strategies um, change faster. Um, there are new methods like adaptive um, um, and other sampling strategies. Um, that get into the, the, the basic literature, um, but I'm not aware of, but, but, I'm, but I'm not really familiar with the, with the um, outcomes of these different sampling strategies. So, so do they perform better or do they perform worse? So the only, um, the only thing I know for the, for the vignettes or for the factorial surveys is um, that these um, quota sampling strategies compared to the random sampling strategies increase efficiency and increase the um, validity of the of the results but all only given that um the confounding patterns are um taken care of and if it's not the case then then you run into troubles but but uh, but in my experience these are currently the state of the art and the the, the the best way or the most efficient way to 
to sample vineyards out of the vineyard Okay, perfect. Thank you. Next on the list is Marvin Brinkmann, who is also going to ask us a question via audio. Yeah, many thanks for the comprehensive overview of the use of vineyards and their possible pitfalls. Uh, I have three questions, uh, but in terms of timing, uh, the biggest question would be the last one. Uh, first of all, uh, a short answer, please. Uh, could you describe the difference between uh, all the terms uh, in this research, such as choice experiments, full factorial designs or vineyard designs, or what's, what's the actual term to use? Um, second, uh, you mentioned that the deletion of illogical vineyards is mostly a problem within de-efficient designs and it would be not for simple random designs. Um, so my question is, uh, what about full factorial designs and how does it affect orthogonality there? And uh, the last, or the bigger question is, um, well, first of all, you, you do a lot of methodological research on factorial designs and you showed uh, that one gets troubles with small fractions of the vineyard universe, as long as one doesn't work with de-efficient designs. So I, I'm working mostly with full factorial designs, so neither the efficient nor simple random sampling. Um, and there is not so much research on full factorial design. So my question is, um, is it stated, or it is stated that every vineyard should be answered at least five times. Uh, what if I have a huge vineyard universe of let's say 3000 or 5000, but also a huge sample of respondents um, and they only answer a few vineyards each person. So every vineyard is only answered like two, three or four times. So uh, yeah, somehow less than five times. What would, uh, what would be the problem? And would it be a problem if I'm primarily interested in between effects? Thank you. Um, okay, so um, regarding the, 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 the first, so um, the difference uh, um, between, the, between the terms is we, we talk here about factorial surveys or vineyard studies, right? And choice experiments, somewhat similar, but you choose between options. So maybe two or three. And um, it's, a, it's like a one zero. It's, it's like a choose, chosen or chosen. And um, a conjoint analysis is, is determining the, the business and the economics literature. And it is similar to, to, to factorial surveys, but it's also more tabular and, and uh, some other features, but it's, it's also a similar method. And the uh, other question, or the other part of the question was the full factorial. This is, so to speak, the vineyard universe. The full factorial is the vineyard universe and anything else is a sample. And it can be a random sample or any other sample, right? Um, and what is the problem with the deletion of logical cases? So it is technically, when you, when you, when you, when you delete logical cases, you create correlation. That's, that's what you statistically do, right? And um, the problem is when you do this after you um, chose a de-efficient design, your de-efficiency changes, obviously, your confounding patterns changes, obviously, and you have lost the total control, you have lost the control you had before, right? And, and then you don't know, you, you end up with, with anything. Um, so it, you, you make it even worse because, because this is a purposeful um, design and um, uh, and you destroyed it, so to speak, afterwards. That's why it has to has to be uh, uh, the the logical combinations have to be specified simultaneously. Um, regarding the um, the random samples or the the, the full factorial, it, you you just introduce correlation. You do, you you do not destroy uh, your 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 very specific um, 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 design because you don't you know, you don't have this. Uh, you don't have a specified design, you just have a sample or the full factorial. And what you do is you just introduce correlation. And um, what is correlation at the end of the day? Yeah, you have to, in your regression models, you, you cannot run t-tests, you cannot run easy uh, comparisons, but you have to control for, for the correlation structure, right? Like in a regression model. Um, therefore, it is, it is not um, a very problem problematic to, to um, um, drop out illogical cases, but you always have to keep in mind you introduce correlation and you, you create um, 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 a little bit more noise than you had before. Uh, and regarding the, the full factorial, so if you have the chance to work with a full factorial uh, um, um, instead of a, a sample, um, I would always go for the full factorial because you, you, you make your life easy, right? Um, so this is, this is always something, this is always a good strategy. Um, the question is, um, 
if it is too big, but I think in your case, it, it, it wasn't too big if I, if I got it right. Um, and the question is, how many times should one win it be, be answered? So in the literature, there's this suggestion between five and 50 times, right? But it depends, it depends heavily on, um, for example, how many levels do each dimensions have? If you have like six dimensions and there, you know, there's level five, level six, it is, it is something different than if you have only zero one dimension. So if, if, you, if you have, um, 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 so to speak, stronger vignettes that, that go stronger in one direction. And um, what, is, what could be the problem? The problem could be that vignette features can be correlated with respondent characteristics. So you have some weird respondent, for example, who has this specific type of vignette and produces a specific effect. And you think, well, this is due to my um, manipulation, but instead it is because of this weird respondent. And to avoid this, you want to have each um, 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 vignette evaluated several, uh, more than one time, yeah, uh, several times. Um, in, in, in your case, as you described, you have many thousands, if I got it right, many thousands of respondents. Um, this problem will be, will likely be neglectable, yeah? So if you, if you have like, so at least realize three or four um, um, respondents who evaluate one vignette, I don't think you run into big problems. Okay, so, so this is mainly a problem if you have like a small sample and if you have um, a limited number of vignettes. And then this is, the problem is, the, so the technical problem is correlation between respondent characteristics and, and um, vignette characteristics. And this should not be too big in your case. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've reached the end of time, but we still have three questions in the chat. Carsten, would you be happy to still answer them? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Perfect. So I'm just going to read them out um, all at once, and maybe we can do this quickly. The first question comes from Christoph Zayons, and it is, what do you say to the criticism that answering the yet does not have any real consequences for the participants, and the answers, therefore, do not really reveal their real behavior or attitudes? The second question, also from Christoph, is how would you compare the factorial survey design to discrete choice experiments? What are the respective advantages and disadvantages? And then question number three comes from uh, David Kretschmer, who asks, in many papers based on factorial survey designs, there are example vignettes and the dimensions are frequently highlighted in some way, so through italics, bold font, etc. It is also common is it also common practice to present vignettes to respondents in this way? Is there any methodological research on whether this is important? Okay, yeah, um, cool. Um, so the first question um, about the real behavior. So in, um, in general, um, uh, vignettes come from this um, uh, research on, on norms, justice attitudes and stuff like this. So um, the um, Many applications actually um, are attitude measures, right? And um, is, is, is there a problem to an attitude measure uh, via um, uh, items? I, I, I don't think so. I think it is, it is even better because you, you come into this, due to the indirect measurement, you come to these underlying um, attitudes. Um, regarding behavior, so what would you do? Uh, if, you, if you have, uh, this is the scenario, would you, I don't know, use the drug, would you go to the party and whatever. And then in this case, you run into the same problems you have whenever you have these um, hypothetical decisions, right? Which is also true for um, choice experiments and, and, uh, and um, things alike. And um, there is research, uh, there are research papers that um, investigate, um, for example, decisions to move and then um, look into like socioeconomic panel and, 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 and data and, and um, investigate um, what, are the, what are the real drivers, what are the mechanisms in real life um, and do they correspond. And, um, and due to, to uh, based on my knowledge, um, the, the um, validity of these um, results is, is quite good. But what we always see is we overestimate the strengths of the, of the connection, right? So um, in, but, I mean, that's, that makes sense because in real life you have hundreds or even more parameters to take care for and not only these five dimensions you would have in the vignettes. So um, my answer is that regarding the real, um, real life behavior, there is research that 
suggests that the intentions to be to, to, to act are similar to the actual actions, um, but um, yeah, not, not perfectly. Um, regarding the factorial survey design um, compared to the district choice um, experiments, um, the, the, the district choice experiments, um, you, would, you would present people, so to speak, different vignettes, so simultaneously, so not only one, but two or three, of course, not in text form, but in tables. And you would then say, okay, you have job offer one, job offer two, job offer three, um, which one would you choose? And then you can estimate again, um, what are the um, relevant factors, for example, working hours, salary, um, 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 flexibility and working hours and stuff like this. And you would end up with a, with a conditional logit model. You, you would, uh, some or some advanced uh, uh, version of it. Um, while in factorial surveys, you would use the sequential approach, right? So you, you answer one vignette and the second one, then the second one, uh, uh, the third one, then the fourth one, and, and, and uh, uh, like this. Um, so you do not have these trade-offs between um, two versions of, I don't know, um, um, of, a, of a contract, of a flag that you want to have, of, of anything. So this is the biggest, biggest um, difference in design. Um, um, due to, uh, based on my knowledge, the, the, the choice experiments are based in random utility theory, so they have a theoretical core that is, that is, that is fixed. And um, <clears throat> the, um, the difference in the analysis is, of course, you use um, conditional logic, you can, um, um, or, or some, some advanced methods of it, while you use um, whatever you want to use in vignettes. And, um, the sampling procedure is more or less the same. So there are also um, possibilities to use a de-efficient sampling for um, for um, choice experiments. Yeah. So it's 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 um, the same procedure. And uh, the third question regarding the highlighting. Um, this is a good question. Yeah. And um, actually, the um, I know people who do some methods research about it, but I don't think it's published yet. So. Um, um, what we, what they checked is whether it is it is useful to have um, highlighted the dimensions because it makes it easier for the respondents to jump to what is what has actually changed right and especially when you do this ten times fifteen times and you don't want to read through all this stuff you maybe maybe get faster um, when it's highlighted so we do it we often do it in our surveys because we think it's a it's a good way to to get the people to pinpoint them to things that change. Um, I, I'm not aware of um, of published research on this, but I'm aware of people who are working on this, and um, they, I, I I didn't think uh, so. So as I recall, if I recall correctly, differences were not too big, but um, um, but suggest that um, highlighting is a, is a good strategy. All right, perfect. So that concludes today's session. Carsten, thank you very much once again for this excellent presentation. Thanks and for having thanks, me. Of course, you're welcome. And thanks to all the members of our audience. We had over 45 participants today, which uh, may have been a new record. So thanks for being here today and for engaging in the discussion. The Social Science Data Lab will be back in February of 2021. We have six exciting events in the spring term, and we will release our event schedule at the beginning of the year. Until then, everybody stay, self, stay safe, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again next year. Bye-bye.